So our speaker today is uh, Dr. Um, uh, Vicki Smith from the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station, uh, and she's going to talk about spotted lanternfly. So Vicki, I'm going to unshare and turn this over to you. Okay, thank you, Mary. I appreciate the opportunity to um, talk to all of you today. I have put in the chat um, a link to the um, uh, experiment station website on spotted lanternfly, specifically the uh, page with the management options for vineyards. Um, and I will put that up, that will be on the presentation as well, but just so you don't have to scramble and write it down real quick, it's there in the chat. Uh, I hope you've heard about spotted lanternfly by now, but what we wanted was to just get across some information for you. So yeah, here's the uh, uh, spotted lanternfly management uh, fact sheet website again for you. But again, that's in the chat, so you don't need to scramble and write that down really quick. And basically, to sum up everything about spotted lanternfly, we wanted it. We want it dead or alive. Um, so if you see it, we'd like for you to report it. Um, if you see it, report it and then smash it or kill it by whatever means that you can. I know that sounds tough, but that's kind of where we are on this thing right now. First of all, what is the spotted lanternfly? Um, it's a not actually a fly. That's a question that we get sometimes. It's not really a fly. It's a great big invasive plant hopper. It's a sucking insect, which means that it feeds on the phloem. We do have a lot of native plant hoppers, but they're very much smaller. But they are all phloem feeders. It's native to Asia. And it arrived in this country, as near as we can tell, on this continent, basically, in 2014 into Pennsylvania in a load of stone that was shipped from Korea. So uh, kind of an unusual pathway for a plant pest to enter. It didn't enter on a plant, but it entered on a load of stone. It has since been found in most of the mid-Atlantic states, including New Jersey, um, Massachusetts, Virginia, West Virginia, New York, Ohio, Delaware, Maryland. Um, we speak a lot of times about a population of spotted lanternfly. We have decided to define population as being um, adults plus egg masses. So a population is something that basically the insects are there, they're settled in, and they're reproducing. Um, this is the view of spotted lanternfly that you're going to see in all the pictures. It looks rather spectacular, and one good thing you can say about spotted lanternfly is it's really easy to identify. It doesn't look like any of our native insects. This is what it's, uh, it looks like out in the real world. Again, pretty spectacular, but in reality, it's pretty hard to spot when it's on a tree trunk. The uh, uh, red underwings are generally not visible when the insect is at rest, and those uh, tan to gray to brown spotted wings make it blend in perfectly with uh, bark or mulch or whatever. So it's uh, deceptively hard to spot when it's out there in the real world. These are uh, some of the life stages of the spotted lanternfly. The black and white thing is either a first or second uh, instar of the nymph. The spectacular looking um, red and white and black is the fourth instar of the nymph. And down in the lower left corner, again, the adult resting. And in the lower right corner, the uh, adult um, spread out and pinned like you're going to see in all the pictures. But what you're going to see out in the real world is the first three, the nymphs and the resting adult. You'll very seldom see the one with its wings nicely spread and those red underwings being very obvious. So just so you know that, it's, it's uh, spectacularly hard to spot when it's out in the real world. Now, what are the hosts of spotted lanternfly? The by far the most favored host is probably the wild and cultivated grape. It this thing really loves grapes. It really loves vineyards. The other favored host, the one that it seems to need to complete its life cycle is tree of heaven. And everybody says, oh, spectacular. Tree of heaven is a weed. It's an invasive species. This thing is going to get rid of tree of heaven, right? Well, not really. It it. There's, there's something in Tree of Heaven that it needs to complete its life cycle. 
We're not really certain what that is, but it does not really kill the tree of heaven. It just basically utilizes it to uh, reproduce and to continue itself. Um, hardwoods that have a sweet sap, such as maple and walnut, are also favored hosts. Um, I know down in Fairfield County here in Connecticut, we very frequently were able to find spotted lanternfly on maples, and that includes um, sugar maples and Japanese maples. So a lot of our favored landscape maples are our favorite hosts of spotted lanternfly, unfortunately. It's also been found on birch and willow, again, plants that have sweet sap. It's also been found on sumac, which looks amazingly like tree of heaven to the untrained eye. Um, it's also been found on roses. So pretty much uh, uh, a wide, wide host range that this thing can be found on. I've also recently found reports that it will go to garden crops such as cucumber and peppers. Um, those, those plants, as you know, have uh, fairly juicy stems. So um, that's another favorite host for spotted lanternfly. I could not find much more information on the garden crops, just a few mentions here and there, but it's again, something to consider and something to keep in mind. Um, every time we talk about an insect, we have to put up a picture of the life cycle. Um, the adults are gonna be out in, we like to say the adults are gonna be out about July 4th. So we start looking for the adults about June 15th to July 1st, but July 4th, definitely you're gonna probably gonna start seeing adults. The uh, adults will um, merrily do their thing uh, all the way up until a hard freeze. They will be egg laying in September through November, which is a very long um, uh, time to be laying eggs. The eggs are the part of the insect that overwinter. The eggs will be present from October until about June when they hatch. Um, we Again, we look for the hatch about June 15th to July 1st. The first, second, and third instars are small black um, insects some people mistake them for ticks, but I don't think they look anything like ticks. Ticks don't have those white spots. And the, uh, all the first through the fourth instar, they will hop, they will jump about, oh, anywhere from 10 to 20 inches high if you disturb them. The fourth instar, which you will see in the midsummer through fall, is a spectacular red, black, and white insect. And then uh, those will turn into adults um, later in the summer and fall and start the cycle all over again. Right now, we're only finding one generation per year. So um, that's one good thing, but um, I will go into some of the um, peculiarities of the, of the uh, life cycle in a minute. So that's our obligatory insect life cycle with the, all the various life stages of the insect. This is a, a shot of females laying eggs. Now, when the eggs are first laid, as you can see from that female right there in the middle, they are kind of white and cottony looking in appearance. Within a few hours, they turn kind of gray and waxy looking. And uh, again, this picture is a little bit deceptive. The egg masses can look like just about anything. They can look like a patch of lichens. They can look like a smear of mud. Um, they, they develop kind of a grayish, uh, sometimes they're shiny, sometimes they're crackly. They just, they, they're really, really hard to spot on, uh, on trees and our surfaces because they look like uh, a lot of other things. This is an older egg mass. The, um, uh, they, they kind of lay, they tend to lay the eggs almost in rows. There can be anywhere from 30 to 90 eggs per egg mass. So that's something to consider when you think about control measures. If you control, if you scrape away and dispose of one egg mass, you also have got just gotten rid of 30 more spotted lanternflies. And we'll get into that in a minute. But this is an older egg mass. They, they get this kind of um, look like, I don't know, they look to me like a stack of rice grains or something like that. So that's what the older egg masses look like. Now, the, now on these pictures, we've focused on what the egg masses look like. But again, they can be very hard to spot in real life. This is a photograph of a boulder. 
in the stone yard where spotted landerfly was first discovered in Pennsylvania. And there is an egg mass here. And again, this egg mass was laid on a boulder. And if you haven't spotted it yet, right there it is, right in the middle. So it can be very difficult to spot the spotted lanternfly egg masses. It's because they look like everything and they look like nothing. Uh, so, so very difficult to find the egg masses out in the real world. However, the nymphs uh, can be fairly easy to spot. The, again, this picture was taken at the stone yard in Pennsylvania where spotted lanternfly originated. Um, this is a whole bunch of fourth instar nymphs with one or two third instar nymphs mixed in there, as well as an old egg mass right about at 12 o'clock on that tree. So you can see there's just a tremendous potential for large populations to build up. There's an awful lot of the fourth instar nymphs here, like I said, just a few of the third instar nymphs. These are fairly easy to spot. But the issue becomes with all of these nymphs, they will develop into adults. This is, this is one of the uh, behaviors that the spotted lanternflies tend to do. They, they build up in large clusters on frequently on the highest point around. So um, tall trees, telephone poles, the tops of the houses, the tops of buildings, they will build up in, in they will cluster on these high points. This behavior has been called swarming. I don't like that because swarming is already used in terms of bees, and it's really not quite the same behavior, but uh, that's the term that's been come to uh, be used with spotted lanternfly. I think you can see from this picture, you can build up large populations of this insect in a fairly short time. This is a swarm in an apple orchard. Tremendous numbers of the insects. I can't even guess how many insects are on this apple tree. You can get lots and lots of insects in a very um, small area when they tend to do this behavior. This swarming can happen practically anywhere. This is a truck tire. Um, I believe this photograph was taken in Pennsylvania with an awful lot of, uh, of uh, fourth instar nymphs on it. And I, again, I can't imagine how many uh, nymphs are on that truck tire. These insects are not particular. They will land just about anywhere. If you stand still long enough, you're probably going to get a spotted lanternfly on you in some of these areas. Now, with these, with these large populations of a phloem feeding insect, um, the, the excrement of the insects is a liquid that's euphemistically referred to as honeydew, and it can build up in tremendous amounts. The honeydew is a very sweet substance. The honeydew itself can be a food source for the black mold called sooty mold. This is uh, some of the understory near a heavily infested tree. As you can see, there's tremendous amounts of sooty mold all over the surface of these leaves. Sooty mold in itself generally is not a problem, but it can shade out um, the plant that it's on. It can prevent the sunlight from reaching the plant surface, and so it will affect uh, photosynthesis. The honeydew can also be very slippery. It can build up on surfaces such as sidewalks, and um, stairways. And there have been reports of people slipping and falling in this slippery, sticky honeydew and injuring themselves quite severely. So, so not only do we have a plant pest, we have sort of an environmental pest with all of this nasty, sticky, sweet uh, excrement from the insect. The honeydew is also attractive to bees and wasps, which can also bring their own problems. People don't generally like to have bees and wasps all over the surfaces of their deck or of their sidewalk or outside their business. So the spotted lanternfly is causing multiple problems here. Not only is it causing damage to the plants, but the excrement is causing a lot of mess on surfaces and on property. Late in the, in the year, the spotted lanternflies are killed by a hard freeze. This is a vineyard, again, I believe in Pennsylvania, that was heavily infested. After a hard freeze, 
the spotted lanternfly adults will drop to the ground and you'll be able to see um, lots and lots of little dead bodies hanging around on the ground. Now, this is another occasion when they're fairly easy to spot because we can see those red underwings. But before that, uh, you may not have been able to spot the insects. Okay, can they survive without tree of heaven? Um, I, I honestly am not certain um, uh, if they can survive without tree of heaven. They do need a tree of heaven to complete their life cycle. Um, do the adults fly to the treetops or climb up the trunks? That is a very good question. The adults, the adults tend to climb up the trunks. So that gives you one indication as to something that has been utilized as a control measure for the adults is sticky bands. And I'll get into that in just a minute. What they tend to do is they will climb up to the highest point and they will fly off in mass. They will fly off in this great cloud of spotted lanternflies. The adults can fly up to a mile or two on their own, which is one way that they, um, that they spread uh, throughout a landscape is they can spread by flying but they do climb up. Um, uh, the fourth in stars, yes, they will also hop quite high. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of a very strange and shocking behavior um, uh, when, you, when you find these things and they, they hop so high. That is also um, one way that people have been used to capture them. You can swat at them with nets and they will hop right into the nets if you do it just right. It takes a little practice, but you can do that and you can capture a lot of the fourth in stars right there. Um, uh, when you talk about egg masses, there are lookalikes. Well, a lot of people think that the egg masses look like gypsy moth egg, egg masses. I don't believe they do. The spotted lanternfly egg masses, when they're fresh, tend to look, look kind of waxy and sticky. When they get a little bit older, they look more gray and um, crumbly. The surface has a lot of cracks in them, whereas gypsy moth egg masses, they tend to almost always look fuzzy or spongy. So that's one that people say looks different. Uh, gypsy moth egg masses also tend to be dark brown. And I apologize, I keep forgetting I use gypsy moth. We're not supposed to use that term anymore. Um, uh, Lymantria, I apologize for that. So uh, do they have any natural enemies? Um, that's another very good question. Unfortunately, in this uh, in, in North America, they do not seem to have any natural enemies. Uh, none of our native birds will feed on spotted lanternfly. That's frequently um, one way that um, uh, introduced populations are kept in check. But right now, they do not have any natural enemies. There's a tremendous amount of research being done going back to areas in Asia uh, to look for um, uh, um, especially fungal parasites that might that we might be able to utilize to keep this thing in check. Uh, I'm not sure what a raw crop is. Um, so I, I'm I guessing I'm guessing row crop, Victoria. Oh, row crops. Um, again, I have seen I have seen reports here and there that certain vegetable crops are at risk, but row crops, I, I have not seen any reports of that. And I'm not saying that that's not possible. I just haven't hasn't uh, hasn't seen any uh, reports. Has North America uh, sent anything so harmful to Asia? Hmm. <laughs> um, perhaps our, our penchant for smoking cigarettes. I think that would be about the only thing that we've sent to Asia that's, that's, uh, that's probably as harmful as spotted lanternfly. So. Uh, Victoria, I do have one more question that came directly yeah. to me for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, they were asking, what is the scale of the egg masses? How, how large are they again? Oh, that's a very good question too. The egg masses range in size from about the size of um, one, uh, about a size of a quarter to, um, I was going to say about the size of two quarters. So, you know, you know, look at the change in your pocket and that's about how big they are. That's a very good question. All right, great. Thank you. So, okay. Victoria, we do have Two more questions that came into the okay. chat box. I'm not sure if you want to address them right now. Yep, I'll, I'll take those. How rapidly is their territory expanding in the US? What's really interesting about spotted lanternfly is for most plant pests, we can say 
that this one or two thing is, things are the pathways, okay? This is one way that the insect spreads around. For a spotted lanternfly, the pathway is anything that moves. We have found spotted lanternfly on, um, um, on loads of pumpkins from New Jersey. Um, spotted lanternfly was intercepted in Maine in decorative hay bales. One of the most interesting pathways we found for spotted lanternfly is there's a company in Connecticut that uh, sells garden sheds and pool houses. And they had their, um, their garden sheds built in, in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, right at the heart of the spotted lanternfly infestation. They were finding spotted lanternflies in the sheds that were coming from Pennsylvania. Spotted lanternfly got to this country on a load of stone. So basically anything that moves. There's been a lot of work being done with uh, moving companies to have people inspect for uh, spotted lanternfly. They found in Pennsylvania that the um, that those moving containers, the pods and the U-Haul containers could be a way for spotted lanternfly to spread around because they will lay their eggs on those things. We're working very closely right now with Metro North to prevent the spread of spotted lanternfly via the trains. So the spotted lanternfly can move at the speed of a, of a train or a moving van or anything like that. Uh, naturally, they, they spread about a mile or two uh, every, every year. But uh, again, uh, all of us people, we are helping spotted lanternfly move around. Would we see any dead red bodies in, in this frigid weather now in Massachusetts? You may not. I would suspect that they have probably broken down by now in the rain and in the snow since the fall. But if you want to go out to the vineyard and look, certainly you could take a look. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not sure that you would see them, but you might. Um, uh, I came in a little late. If I live in the forest in the Adirondacks, have never seen a tree of heaven, will FLS stay here if brought here? That's a good question. Um, it may not if you don't have any tree of heaven. Early on in, in the history of spotted lanternfly, we decided to look for tree of heaven in the state. And what we found is that tree of heaven is basically everywhere. Tree of Heaven grows in what I would ca categorize as neglected areas, such as the back end of a shopping center. It grows along highway off ramps. It grows along railroad right of ways. It grows in vacant lots. It grows in, in areas that people don't pay much attention to. So it's pretty much everywhere. Spotted lanternfly, again, will also utilize maples. We found a lot of spotted lanternflies last year on Japanese maples, which is a, it's just a very popular ornamental tree. So I won't say that if you don't have tree of heaven, you won't have spotted lanternfly because it can do just fine on maples. Uh, folks in other states have reported it being on uh, walnut and willow as well. So can't, you know, never say never with spotted lanternfly. So, okay. Any other questions or comments? Because we've got, got some more to tell you here. Now, we had some questions about host preferences. The nymphs by far utilize um, early in the season, they will be utilizing the rose and the grape and the tree of heaven, especially later on in the year, they're gonna be utilizing some of the trees like black walnut, willow, sumac, and the maples. The adults, by far are going to be more on the, again, the grapes and tree of heaven and the adults are going to be utilizing the trees as well. What's common across both uh, all of these months and all of the uh, uh, life stages is utilizing the grape and the tree of heaven as host preferences. So um, fairly wide um, host preference range for this, for this insect. Now, we had a couple questions about management. And again, we like to talk about biological control. Um, it, I said before, there's no known natural enemies in the US, which is unfortunate. Um, it's always nice if something would be a natural enemy, but right now we don't know of one. That doesn't mean it won't be discovered. Um, there's a lot of work being done on a fungal pathogen, the Bovaria bassiana, this thing, 
uh, is a pathogen of both the nymphs and the adults. And there's a lot of work being done on this to try to develop that to utilize as a natural control of spotted lanternfly. But again, that's just in the developmental stages. Um, there's a lot of exploration of the native regions of spotted lanternfly to search for more pathogens, more parasitoids. And again, that's, that's just in the beginning phases of that work to try to find something. Uh, unfortunately, our native birds do not feed on spotted lanternfly. Uh, you're probably familiar with uh, the emerald ash borer by now and how the woodpeckers will feed on the uh, larvae of emerald ash borer. Nothing really feeds on um, spotted lanternfly, which is uh, uh, really unfortunate. Um, we talk about, about cultural control of spotted lanternfly and everybody says, oh, eliminate tree of heavens and wild grapevines. Well, tree of heaven is pretty much everywhere. Um, that's one way certainly you can reduce uh, the population around your property is to get rid of these wild hosts, but I don't think you're going to eliminate it. Now, since the spotted lanternfly utilizes tree of heaven to reproduce, there's been a lot of work looking at treating the tree of heaven with systemic insecticides. And there has been some success with, with this, but you need to be aware of potential drift of pesticides and uh, certain restrictions on the neonicotinoid pesticides. So just need to be aware of, of use. What, what has been done is that you leave a few tree of heaven, treat those with insecticides, and the spotted lanternfly goes to those few trees that you've left and they become dosed with the pesticides while they're feeding on them. So that can work, but just be aware of the complications uh, associated with pesticide use. Now, a lot of grape growers have been trying to utilize exclusion netting of a very fine mesh to keep the spotted lanternflies off the grapes. And this can work, but it may also reduce the bricks in the grapes at harvest. So a trade-off there, you're going to have less spotted lanternfly, but you're also going to have a reduction in the bricks of the grapes. There are traps out there to uh, trap the uh, spotted lanternfly, something called a circle trap, which is a kind of a complicated array of screen and sticks and lures and sticky bands, which is basically gluey bands that you uh, circle around the trees or the grapevines. But the traps are not great. And I'll get into that in just a minute. Um, a lot of people say uh, uh, egg destruct egg destruction through scraping the eggs off and scraping them into alcohol or burning the eggs off with a, with a little butane torch. And again, you're going to eliminate a tremendous number of spotted lantern flies, but you're not going to find all the egg masses that are out there. And there's going to be egg masses that are going to be too high for you to reach through scraping and burning. So these cultural methods, um, they, um, they will help, but they won't be the, um, the, the, the best way to really seriously reduce the population. Now, this is some of the complications. The photograph on the left is what's called a circle trap. And again, it's basically a ring of, of looks like window screen that goes around the tree with a couple of sticks positioned in there to hold it up, a lure at the top in that plastic bag, Co sort of a complicated affair, but the idea is the insects will be climbing up the tree as they are wont to do. They will get uh, the screen, will funnel them in uh, into the plastic bag, and they will also be caught in that lure as well. Um, this is the photograph on the right illustrates the problems with sticky bands. Yes, they're going to catch spotted lanternflies, but they're also going to catch a lot of other things. Um, I was told that this poor little red bellied woodpecker did survive. He was rescued. Um, but sticky bands um, have a couple of complications. They will catch basically anything that lands on the sticky band. In areas where spotted lanternfly populations are very high, the sticky bands can become paved with dead bodies of spotted lanternflies. And the subsequent ones will simply walk right over their dead brothers and sisters and continue their way up the tree. So sticky bands are not great. They might help, but they're not great. Um, and again, you can catch all sorts of things on a sticky band. 
Um, by far, some of the probably the most promising way of spotted lanternfly management that we have now is chemical control. Um, you can treat the egg masses with oil or chlorpyrifos. And um, just so you're not scrambling to write all this down, I have another slide coming up and, and the link to all of our uh, control measures is in the chat. Um, so you can treat those egg masses with oil, uh, chlorpyrifos. The imps, the, excuse me, the nymphs are susceptible to many different insecticides and the adults are susceptible to many different insecticides, but you need to be aware of pre-harvest intervals. One advantage is you may no only need to treat the edges of the vineyard to keep the adults out. You may not need to treat the entire acreage of the vineyard. And always, 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 as all of you certainly remember, the label's the law. You really should, cannot legally apply a pesticide that's in a manner that's not on the label. And always, always, always be aware of non-target activity. Just like the poor woodpecker getting stuck on the sticky band, uh, many insecticides can have uh, activity that you don't intend. Um, the, the, the website at the bottom is for, uh, has got all, all the chemical recommendations um, that we're talking about. Now, here's the obligatory uh, slide with way too much information on it. And again, you can find this chart at that website, um, so you don't have to scramble to write it down. But you can see that um, there's a lot of things that are registered um, for control of spotted landerflies. Some of them are restricted, so you will need to have a, um, an applicator's license to apply those, but some of them are not. Um, so uh, there's, there's, there's options out there. So, and I'll, I'll leave that up for just a second um, in case you wanna take some notes on it. But again, that information is, is on the website that I put in the chat. So, um, one thing that does help control spotted lantern fly is a hard freeze. The hard freeze, excuse me, the adults are going to be killed by a freeze below about 28 degrees Fahrenheit. In the autumn, it's, it's smart to scout for and destroy any egg masses that you find because um, that hard freeze will also get rid of a lot of the foliage on your plants, so you'll be able to see things a lot better than you would when, uh, other than when there's a lot of uh, foliage uh, on the plants. You'll be able to look at the stems and look at the branches and look at um, such things as fence posts and wires where they might have uh, deposited their eggs. You may only need to scout the edges of the vineyards for hot spots as well. And again, if you've been able to keep them out, you can look around the edges for areas where there might be an incursion uh, uh, into the vineyard. Now, I know you, uh, we have people from all over uh, southern New England, but I'm going to give you a brief history of what we've been doing in Connecticut uh, concerning spotted lanternfly. Our, our first report was a single dead adult found in Farmington in 2018. Now we determined that this, this dead adult uh, was caught in the grill of someone's car. They had been down in Pennsylvania visiting grandchildren. They, they spotted lanternfly, got stuck in their car. They drove back with it and it dropped off their car. In 2019, someone photographed a spotted lantern fly at a gas station in Southbury, Connecticut, um, and posted the thing on iNaturalist. And it took quite a bit of sleuthing to discover who posted it, get the details as to where the location was, and then follow up in Southbury in 2019. Then came 2020, the year that gave us all lots and lots of good things, when we found a number of populations uh, centered in lower Fairfield County. 2020 brought us so many good things, including pandemic and uh, quarantines and all sorts of things, and spotted lanternfly was just one of those gifts. Um, again, a population is adults plus egg masses. So we realize that the spotted lantern flies that we found in 2020 had probably been there for a year or two before we found them. In 2021, we enacted an emergency quarantine regulation for the entire state. And I'll get into the details on that in a little bit. 
Um, this is the location where we have found um, um, spotted lanternflies in um, lower Fairfield County. We've also had some finds in Litchfield County and in Hartford County. Um, uh, this is where it is. And spotted lanternfly tends to follow transportation corridors. We found spotted lanternfly at a couple of different rest stops on the Merritt Parkway. We found spotted lanternfly at um, a rest stop on Interstate 95 and then at a large shopping mall right off the interstate on 95. So tr this thing follows transportation corridors um, um, basically is where we're finding it. That's been true for other states. In Pennsylvania, they found it uh, following rail lines. Um, so it again, it, it hitches rides on just about anything that it can. Now, we put in uh, an emergency quarantine for the state of Connecticut last year based on our this assumption. Spotted lanternfly will rapidly overspread um, the state before any actual quarantine that can, that can be really enacted. We knew that we just didn't have much time for this thing to travel the 90 miles from one end of the state to the other. What we are doing is we're trying to slow the spread, STS, slow the spread through the use of compliance agreements by entities that may be pathways, such as nurseries, rail, trucking, moving vans, rental cars. Basically, if you're moving any commodity, we are asking that you enter into a compliance agreement. And basically, the compliance agreement says, I will make my staff aware of everything that I can about spotted lanternfly. We will inspect and we will do what we can to not spread the insect around. Um, that was a little bit controversial when we put it into effect because everybody says you've got to do something to stop it and we're saying the experience in other states says that you can't really stop this thing we're going to try to slow it down as best that we can we are also relying on public outreach for reporting we have set up a couple of reporting uh, emails for people to uh, report when they find spotted lantern flight so what are we doing now in Connecticut? Our next steps. Well, here's our reporting websites. And I'll leave those up there for a minute or two. Uh, specifically, report spotted lanternfly, report slf at ct.gov. And the second one is our general reporting website. Basically, if you have an insect that you don't recognize, or a weed, or a plant, or uh, an earthworm or whatever, you can send it to that one as well. But please, by all means, include a photo or two in all reports. We like to say we don't scramble the fighter jets without a photograph. So include a photograph. Um, even if it's a bad blurry photograph, put it in there because a lot of times those are good enough we can make an identification. Like I said, the one good thing about spotted lanternflies, it doesn't look like anything else. Um, we're doing a, a spotted lanternfly survey through CAPS, Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey and uh, Plant Pest Act surveys. Uh, these are basically visuals, visual surveys, uh, basically going out to sites that may be uh, favorable for spotted lanternfly, such as vineyards and orchards, and uh, taking a look around and putting and reporting on those. We have planned to do outreach with posters, fact sheets, scraper cards, etc. That has been somewhat uh, curtailed because a lot of in-person meetings and events have been um, limited due to staffing shortages and pandemic restrictions, but we're trying to get those words out as much as possible, as well as talking to you all today. I will tell you that when you send an email to either of those two uh, reporting sites, um, those are not dead sites. It's not going to be an email that you're going to report, send something to, and you're never hear from them. I promise you that you will get an answer because I answer every one of them. Um, if you don't hear from me in a day or two, um, uh, you will. You will get an answer if you send me an email, but send a picture. We don't do anything without a picture. Um, so I, uh, 
keep an eye out for spotted lanternfly. Um, this is not really natural size, but uh, still keep an eye out. I wish that all, the all spotted lanternfly were this easy to spot. Unfortunately, they're, they're not, but keep an eye out. And remember, it's wanted, dead or alive, but mostly dead. If you see them, squash them. So that's basically what I have for you today. I will look at the chat right now and see what people are talking about. Let's see, there we go. Let's go back to the chat. Um, how is it controlled in Azure? What are the natural predators? I don't honestly know right now what some of the natural pre uh, predators in Asia are. Like I said, the most promising thing on the horizon is the fungus, the Bovaria bassiana, but I really don't have a good answer for that. And I apologize for that. Uh, what damage does SLF cause to its host plants? Does it kill trees? That is a really, really good question. I I posed that question to some of my buddies in the forestry community, and they said, right now, we don't have evidence that it is killing the maples. We don't have evidence that it's killing the walnuts. It is utilizing these plants as a host, but we don't have evidence that it kills them. There is some evidence that spotted lanternfly will suppress and sometimes kill understory plants because of the sooty mold from the excrement. So the spotted lanternflies feed on the trees, they poop out this liquid excrement and the sooty mold grows on them and that can affect regeneration of understory. But does it kill the host plants? There's not much evidence of that. So uh, we put the sticky side in, uh, in instead of out and around the batting on the trees. That has been proposed and um, that may work um, again. Uh, you want to, you know, sticky bands are are kind of a double edged sword. They will capture a lot of the insects, but they'll also capture a lot of everything else. And uh, they can become ineffective if they become paved with dead bodies. How well does spotted lantern fly over winter here in the Northeast? It does just fine. Um, we suspect that the populations that we found in 2020 had been there for at least a couple of years. So um, it, it, you know, all the evidence that we have is that it does just fine. It's been found all the way across the state of Pennsylvania, which probably get in interior Pennsylvania, it probably gets just as cold there as it does here. So it's been doing just fine. Very good question. Um, there's the link again. Is a raise uh, a residactin uh, as a directin effective? Um, I'm not sure on that. Um, I'm not sure that that's even registered. I can't remember some of the uh, recommendations on that. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that one. Are there different reporting protocols contacts in every state? Generally there are, if you are in another state and you send a report to me, I will make sure that it gets to the proper person in another state. Um, I actually have a database that I use um, uh, for reports in other states and I can just forward the messages directly on to the person in the other state that's fielding those reports. But, um, you know, I'm sure that if you look up, if you enter into a Google search, you say spotted lanternfly reporting in New York or spotted lanternfly reporting in Massachusetts, um, you will be able to find out who to report it to. But if you report it to me, I'll forward it on. So, um, is there a temperature threshold for eggs or nymphs? Um, the eggs are what overwinters, so um, they can withstand a fairly cold temperature. As for the nymphs, I am not sure about that. I would hope that we wouldn't get a lot of cold temperature in the summer when the nymphs are around or we'd have bigger problems than spotted lanternflies. Uh, don't want a hard freeze in July, certainly. Oh, thank you. Um, three questions in the poll. Any evidence or damage or kill on apple trees? Again, I have not seen um, uh, the I, I don't have any information on the damage to the trees itself. They are utilizing uh, the tree for feeding and they are utilizing these trees for their swarming, their massing behavior. Um, but again, damage to the trees, I don't know about that. 
Uh, can inspect see damage. Uh, is spotted lanternfly a vector of any known plant diseases? That is a really good question. Uh, it's not. It's not known as a vector. Like we said before, the, the black sooty mold grows on the excrement, but that's not really acting as a vector. The sooty mold is just taking advantage of that sweet substrate. And uh, so it's not really uh, a vector of plant diseases. If they don't cause much damage on host plants, why are they such a problem? Because spotted lanternflies will kill a vineyard in two years. Um, there has been a lot of reports out of Pennsylvania about established vineyards, vineyards that have been there for 15 or 20 years being dead in two years after spotted lanternfly infestation. Um, they are also... Um, a significant uh, uh, import pest. If you are sending your plant material to other countries, um, you certainly do not want to have spotted lanternflies in that consignment because they will get rejected and destroyed right at the border and nobody wants that. So uh, they are a, are a problem. Um, uh, that's a good question. Uh, summer apple spray programs with insecticide be sufficient to manage populations within apple. Um, I am not certain about that. Um, uh, I would suspect that it would be, but I, I'm not certain about that one. Do they only move around in the egg mass? The adults can move around, can move up to a mile or two on their own. They are a fairly strong flyer. So the adults can move up to uh, a mile or two on their own. It's the egg masses are, are primarily responsible for uh, long distance transport because these, the adults will lay their eggs on anything that stands still long enough. Uh, they'll lay them on vehicles, on, um, on, uh, on pots, on household goods. They will lay their eggs just about anywhere. Are they poisonous to any humans or animals? That's been, it's been reported from Pennsylvania. Again, the, Pennsylvania has had the largest, the longest history with this, that, that dogs who will, you know, I love dogs, but they will eat just about anything. That, that dogs that have eaten a large number of spotted lanternflies have gotten sick from eating um, the spotted lanternflies. Most animals won't touch them, I think because primarily because they're not familiar with them. Um, so there've been reports of dogs getting sick after ingesting large numbers of spotted lanternflies. Since spotted lanternflies are so large, it must, it must require larger doses of pesticide to control. I doubt it because um, these things are phloem feeders. They're getting, they're sucking the phloem from the plants. Um, uh, and, and especially with the systemic insecticides, those, this is gonna be a sufficient dose to kill the adults. Uh, will spotted lanternfly kill cultivated blueberry bushes? That I don't know. I, I, that's a very good question. I would not be surprised because the stems are so narrow and the bark is so thin. Um, spotted lanternfly, um, especially when the adults are newly emerged, they like things with thinner bark. So I wouldn't be surprised. How do they destroy vineyards? They kill the plants. They suck the plants dry. They, they are, like I said, they're phloem feeders. They suck, um, they suck all of the vital uh, juices out of the plants. So that's how they destroy the vineyards. Let's see, anything more in the chat? Is that all from the chat? I think we got another one that just popped we in. We got Victoria. another one just, uh, do nymphs feed or just the adults? Yes, the nymphs will feed uh, as well as the adults. So the uh, both, uh, all life stages will feed. So. Any other, uh, um, someone commented, but they haven't been on economic uh, consequences at this point. That's a good, good. I'm glad, uh, glad to hear that. Uh, any evidence of spotted lanternfly spreading fire blight or other disease? There's been no evidence that I know of, and it could be simply that no one is looking at that. Um, Any other questions or comments? 
there's a lot of information out there online about spotted lanternfly. It has become kind of the uh, uh, insect of the last couple of years. So there's a lot out there for you to look at. So I'll just jump in. Um, I'll give people a few more minutes. Please feel free to uh, type your questions into the chat box. Or at this point, I think you would also be welcome to take yourself off mute if you want to ask Victoria any questions directly. So we got some more coming into the chat okay. box. Okay, uh, is feeding on the leaves only or woody parts as well? Um, it it can feed basically on any part of the plant that it can get its mouth get its mouth parts into. Like I said, it it is it feeds more easily on thin barked um, uh, areas of the plant. It will also feed primarily on the petioles because that's a very rich place where. Um, it's a very good place to feed because there's a lot of uh, a lot of phloem tissue there. So how quickly will a plant die one season or slowly over time due to weakening? Well, I would say yes. <laughs> um, uh, like I said, it has been reports of vineyards succumbing in a year or two. Um, the plant is going to be weakened. So if you get a heavy spotted lanternfly feeding combined with, let's say, drought stress or heat stress or a severe winter, that plant is going to uh, go down a lot quicker than one that didn't have those additional stresses on it. So. So let's see, so far has it not caused ecological damage? Um, not that we know of, and I think by ecological damage, you mean displacing natives or killing important native plants. Not uh, as far as I know, but again, that, that kind of remains to be seen. We've only been dealing with this insect since 2014. Um, you know, it's, it's only been in this country since, like I say, in, in this continent since 2014. So there's still a lot we, ha we uh, need to uh, learn about this. Have any been reported in Vermont? As far as I know, there's not been populations found in Vermont. There has been interceptions in, in Vermont. Now, by an interception, that means um, a dead bug was found in a load of pumpkins, or a dead insect was found in a moving van, or a live insect was found in a rental car. There has been interceptions, but so far as I know, there's not been populations reported. Um, what was the next question? Um, is SLF going to be pervasive? Um, I'm afraid that it could become that way. It could become just like brown marmorated stink bug or um, emerald ash borer, part of our environment, which is unfortunate. Is there anything one can put on the bushes now Why pruning in the hard winter weather? Um, I don't believe so. I believe it has to be a little bit warmer before you should apply oil to the egg masses. But uh, you'd have to check on the label on that. I don't have that information right on the top of my head. Uh, are either red grapes or white grapes more enticing? Um, I believe that um, it's grape in general. This thing will also go to wild grapes, which are generally more of the dark, um, dark purple, dark, uh, dark red kind of grapes. So um, I don't think that it has a preference for red or white grapes. Is there a resting stage during this change? Yeah, the, uh, the nymphs go into a very brief pupa pupation before they turn into the adults. Um, it's, it's not really an incomplete life cycle, but there is a big difference between the fourth instar and the adults. But, um, you know, it's, it's there. They, uh, and, and fortunately, they, so far, uh, as we know, they only have one uh, cycle of, uh, of eggs to adults in every year. How much risk of immigrating uh, SLF moving into the woods, even you controlled it? Could they move in between applications to cause damage? Uh, certainly they could. If you get an incomplete kill, um, certainly they could move. 
Okay, any other questions, commentary? Well, I'd like to take this moment to thank you, Vicki. That was an uh, outstanding presentation. Uh, a lot of great information for all of us. Again, if you have any other questions or, or um, if you think you see spotted lanternfly, please send me an email. If you're not in Connecticut, I will forward it to the appropriate person in the other in whatever state. Um, uh, no inquiry is ignored. Let's put it that way. Every inquiry gets an answer. <laughs> so uh, uh, take it from there. I really appreciate the opportunity to get the word out. Um, we've had such limited outreach opportunities lately. Um, what with all the meetings going virtual. So I really appreciate this opportunity to uh, help get the word out about Spotted Lanternfly.